everyone, and welcome to the Penny Stamps Distinguished Speaker Series. My name is Christina Hamilton, the series director. Today, we are very pleased to be presenting from afar Ghanaian artist and cultural organizer, Ibrahim Mahama. And a big thank you to our partner today, uh, as this program is co-presented by the Institute for Humanities. Uh, and congratulations to them. The Institute for Humanities has just announced that they have been awarded a $1.4 million Mellon Foundation grant for high stakes art. So, um, yeah. That's a big deal and good for all of us here at U of M, because we get to be part of experiencing that high stakes art, uh, such as our guest today, Ibrahim, is actually part of his visit is to be here for a site visit for a project with the Institute that will take place in the fall of 2020 as part of that project. In the meantime, you should also go and see, they have a wonderful exhibition at the Institute right now, a series of paintings by Ruth Leonella Buontello, uh, which was inspired, yeah, somebody saw it. Uh, you should all go see it. This is inspired by uh, the current immigration policy of separation and detainment uh, by, at the U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, it's a very moving piece. So before we get started, I want to introduce and welcome, we have a special group in the house with us today. This is the Stamp School's Dean's Advisory Council and alumni who are here for a strategic advisory committee meeting. Uh, this group is apprised of alumni from the school who have embarked from the school and found success in the world. Uh, so uh, let that be an example and a beacon to you, students in the audience. You too will find your path. Uh, so thank you all for being here for your time and energy over the next few days. Yeah. Uh, and with the gathering of this group today, we also wanted to take a moment to honor the passing of someone who was a part of the council uh, and who left us far too early this past December, our dearest friend, a fierce advocate, true visionary, our patroness, Penny Stamps. Uh, I realize for many of you here, especially our new students in the house, uh, this may also for you be an introduction to Penny. Uh, so you should know that she would be so excited for you as you embark on your journey uh, here at the university and afterwards and beyond. Uh, she was a Stamp School alum, of course, and a designer. Penny believed firmly in the power of creative practice and she encouraged students to pursue their, pursue their big ideas. So dream engage and imagine and do it all with her. All of us here today are very lucky as through her generosity she continues to bring us together and this was something that Penny was very good at bringing people together. As part of her deep commitment uh, to student support many years ago now actually 20 years ago uh, she saw a critical need for art and design students and in 1999 she began uh, what would become the Penny Stamps Distinguished Speaker Series. Uh, this weekly series has evolved far beyond the walls of the Academy now, itself uh, becoming a hallmark of our larger community, regionally and beyond, uh, and a powerful generative space for the proliferation of ideas. She loved this series, uh, and even more than that, she loved the opportunity that it affords all of us. And though we miss her presence very much, as typically, as I say, she would have been here with us today, uh, being a part of this council. Um, and I have, here's a photo from a previous moment of Penny among us. Uh, and there's very much to miss about this woman. Practical, straightforward, her presence was elegant, she had indelible style and beauty, a wonderful sense of humor and diplomacy, uh, but perhaps most of all, she had a very deep sense of caring uh, and a nurturing spirit uh, as evidenced here today with all of us. Uh, she was grace defined. And this is one of her favorite photographs of herself, which was actually taken uh, by someone who was a guest in the speaker series many years ago now, Robert Wilson. Uh, in 2012, the University Board of Regents uh, voted to name the Art and Design School for Penny in honor of her commitment to giving at the university. The school is incidentally also the first and only named school for a woman at Michigan. Uh, yeah! 
Pretty exciting, that is. And Penny loved that fact. She really, really did. Uh, we had a school naming celebration for her. Uh, back, I guess, I think that was not in 2012, that was in 2013, that spring after the uh, Board of Regents had uh, named the, uh, put her name on the school. And the speakers in the speaker series heard about this and they all, they wanted so much to be a part of it. And uh, we sorted out a way for them to do that. And they put together a video note, a video card to Penny uh, that we played for her at the naming ceremony. And we've never shared it beyond that. And I thought we would show it today in her honor. And you could see some of your probably favorite folks in the series or folks who haven't been here before, folks you missed in the series. Uh, so here is uh, our note uh, to Penny from her speakers uh, at her naming celebration. This is, this is, this is, this is for Penny. 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 Penny Sams. Penny, first of all, I want to thank you for what you're accomplishing there and give a huge congratulations on this very special day and also join the University of Michigan in honoring you. I got a wonderful chance to participate a few months ago in Ann Arbor as a Penny Stamps speaker. I could sit there right on that stage firing questions at Oliver Stone, which was a lot of fun for both of us, I should tell you. More importantly, there were hundreds of students and professors and residents from all over Ann Arbor asking their questions as well. And that is what education is really all about. Conversations, interaction, debates. I'm also thrilled to hear you have secured it for the future. You're a crucial advocate of art and design, creative education, and to the proliferation of ideas. I know students will reap the benefits of your generous support as well as the community at large. We are all really looking forward to seeing the Stamp School name attached to our creative leaders right there in the future. Who, who, who's Penny Stamp Series? Penny, I want to congratulate you and join everybody at the University of Michigan in honoring you on this uh, special day. Uh, the Penny Stamp Speaker Series is, a, is, is wonderful, and my personal experience of it was, was tremendous. I particularly remember, I think it's the only time in my speaking career that I've been serenaded onto stage by a full cinema organ playing Land of the Rising Sun. Your event is spectacular, and um, the Penny Stamps lectures are going to become a permanent fixture of the University of Michigan, and that is wonderful. It was wonderful to speak at the event. The venue was terrific, the students were wonderful, the whole evening was a joy. And the Penny Stamp Series was a high! You probably don't know this, but you ruined me for any other lecture. The, seeing my, my name up on the marquee was just like too much, and then having this engaged audience with the theater incredibly full just meant that you, you just made it possible for me to lecture any other place. I love doing it so much at the University of Michigan. I remember fondly the warm hospitality and professionalism of the staff and the keen engagement of the public that came that night to hear me there in Ann Arbor. I did the lectures, then saw the students afterwards, and it's a great institution that you have founded. Penny, I'm here to thank you for being a design angel. <laughs> <laughs> and the greatest Italian supporter of design that one can possibly find. No, seriously speaking, it is moving to see so much passion for design. It is not only moving, it's important. We wish, we all wish designers, students, professors, everybody, we all wish that the world understood a 50th of what you understand. If Penny can pull this off now with a secure future and bring in guests every week who are better speakers than I uh, and have a wealth of life experience, uh, the community is going to benefit in a very large way. It's a wonderful series. Thank you. Congratulations on the wonderful honor. You deserve it. It's an amazing gift to give to the school, and Michigan is lucky to have you. You're fantastic, and we're very lucky to know you. This is for her, for Pete. For me to see. 
I was very excited. To, I, I was very excited to be invited to be part of this penny stamps thing. And I didn't know what it was. I just thought it was, yeah, this is cool. And then I started to talk to my colleagues um, about uh, being invited to be part of this. And they all went, penny stamps? And I'm like, yeah. And they were all like, the penny stamps? And that was my first clue that this was something. This is an extraordinary series. It brings the town and the gown together, and I just feel privileged. I grew up in Ann Arbor and come back as often as I can, and this really meant something to me, and I'm so grateful for your generosity to the community. Uh, permitting me to be part of this uh, for just a couple of hours was one of the great thrills of my life, and uh, I can't wait to come back and see more. It was not just about students, but the entire community, organization, the enthusiasm, the warmth of the people I met there. It really, it was really, really uh, touching my heart. This kind of lecture series, it's important for culture in general. To see, to see. And so I decided to ask a few students about their thoughts, feelings, and impressions of the series. So here are a few of those thoughts. Every Thursday, my friends meet me at the Michigan Theater under the marquee. We're among thousands who are gathered there. We like to look around. It's a town and gown affair. The lights come down. The organist descends. Applause begins. Why, I like to think of it as a kind of church myself. Church of Ideas, another student was quick to add. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I say thank you. Thank you for your belief in the proliferation of ideas. Penny. Step. Kind of fun. <sighs> so, Penny Stamps has given us so much more than a speaker series. She's given us the gift of connection, a space where the entire community comes together to learn, to experience, and to expand our perspectives. And the good news is her generosity persists and we can all continue to enjoy the bounty of her legacy each week in her name. Uh, in honor of Penny today, we are, have uh, two ways that we want to tell you where you can more deeply engage with this program by joining us. We have a year-long gratitude campaign uh, going on in her honor. We invite the community to join us in support of the speaker series and become a direct part of the continuing legacy of this free public forum. If the series is something that you look forward to and that fuels your creative process, that expands your worldview, we hope that you will join us. Make a gift if you can and join us, become a part of, we have a new group, a new alliance called the Friends of the Penny Stamp Series. So join us. And another way that everyone can engage is through our letter writing campaign. Uh, this is a direct lesson from Penny herself as she was a devotee of the tried and true tradition of personal handscripted 
correspondence. Uh, she was always in search of good stationery, and her letter writing was exceptional. Uh, she understood the power that it had to connect people, and it was part of the glue of this network that she created uh, in gathering people together. So as remembering her, we heed her lesson. Uh, we invite you to write a note to her family expressing what this series means to you. There are tables, two tables in the lobby actually with good stationery provided. Uh, and there's a box to leave the notes in. You can uh, write a note today. You can think about it and take a piece of stationery with you and bring it back next week. We'll have uh, the stationery and the letterbox uh, available throughout the campaign this fall. Uh, you can also, at the table, get a copy of this new uh, school magazine issue of Emergence, which has a wonderful article about Penny in it and a beautiful artwork of Penny as well. Uh, so those are out there on those tables. And also the Friends of the Penny Stamp series campaign uh, information is available as well. So moving right along now, we will have a Q&A today and you can meet uh, Ibrahim directly following his talk here on the stage in the screening room out the doors to the left, uh, down near the bathrooms, you'll find the other lobby for the screening room. So join us there right after. Uh, please remember to silence your cell phones. And now for a proper introduction of our series guest, please welcome our great partner of the Stamp Series and the dynamic curator of the Institute for Humanities, Amanda Krugliak. to just start by saying I feel so lucky all of the years we've been doing this, you know, to have a great partners like the Penny Stamps, Christina Hamilton and the School of Art that I love, it's my alma mater, and uh, people who support the work that we do, like Penny Stamps, like the Mellon Foundation, and artists like Ibrahim Mahama and Ruth Buenteo, and so many other people that uh, feel like it changes the story that we tell. So what's the story? Our insatiable desire to want, to collect, to covet, to own, to colonize, to co-opt, to take somebody else's stuff all the time, to appropriate the proverbial coat of many colors. In these urgent times of movement and migration, displacement, due to the impacts of climate change, violence, economic disparities, and our complicity, the only way to write history is with an informed perspective, a willingness to see things differently, our creative vision, our humanity. There is no running fence between us. Ghanaian artist Ibrahim Mahama's work suggests that he is an alchemist, conjuring up ghosts of the past, bringing life to artifacts and objects across time, telling stories. They serve as a trace, remnants for the exchange, the human cost of capitalism, commodification, globalization, the optimism and disillusionment of Ghanaian citizens pre and post independence. In conversation with him these past days, it seems like he truly has been sent from the future, a time traveler, not young or old, a visionary meant to change things beyond the words, words, words that we stumble on like hope or good intentions, resolutions, pushing past them to respond to get on with it, what can we do? That promise. Muhammad's public interventions made collaboratively are a commitment to community. He believes that art can affect change rather than simply being about making something for sale. His work sorts out a new order of things, a cultural recycling, reinvention, amending a hand-sewn map of the whole world. 
Mahama received his Bachelor of Fine Arts in Painting 2011 and Master of Fine Arts in Painting and Sculpture 2013 at the Kwame Nrumah University of Science and Technology, Kamase, Ghana, and is currently working on his doctorate. At 32, he's already done so much. He's made so much work, notably as part of the Venice Biennale 2015, Documenta 14 in Castle, Germany, and Athens, Greece, 2017, and was the youngest artist to exhibit in the first Ghanaian pavilion at the Venice Biennale 2019. He recently opened Parliament of Ghosts in Manchester, England at the Whitworth Gallery, He'll work with the Astor Gates in 2020, the Sydney Biennale 2020, and here to work with us at the Institute. But what is most exciting is the opening of his own artist-run Savannah Center for the Arts, Contemporary Art, Tamale Ghana. His contribution towards the development and expansion of the contemporary art scene in his country filling notebooks with plans for constructing educational centers out of train cars and old airplanes, building movie theaters, erecting marquees, building museums, activating space. He says, I'm an artist who wants to work in Africa, and I'm tired of producing work that gets exported to Europe and America. I want local people to experience art made in Ghana, to experience what you get to experience. Please join me in welcoming Ibrahim Mahama. Hello, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much for taking the time to come. Uh, it's been such a long journey to get here, but I'm really excited. I think it's always very exciting to have a conversation with uh, not just students alike, but people who are really interested in like, um, developing their practices and then finding new ways of uh, giving new experiences. Um, thank you, Amanda, for inviting me, and thank you, Christina, for organizing everything. I think it's been truly amazing being here in uh, Anabo. I come from a very small town, just as this place. So it's very exciting when you go to a place which is very quiet, and yet you find people who are very like, welcoming and very warm. So thank you very much for having me. Um, where do I start from? Let me see if I start. OK. So uh, as Amanda said, I. I had my training in Ghana at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology where I studied painting and sculpture in my undergrad. And then I went back to the same university to do my MFA in painting and sculpture. And then I went back there again to do a PhD in painting and sculpture. There was always a necessity to go back to this idea of painting and sculpture. What is this whole notion of it? Um, of course, at the time when I was a student, before, prior to that, there were a lot of, um, we, we were basically using the old British curriculum, so the hand and eye, so um, art making within that tradition was very somehow obscured. And we had a new generation of artists, uh, which was led by one man called Dr. Karikacha, who decided that he was going to actually take on the role of being a professor to come back to the university and somehow challenge the existing system, like the, the, the curriculum that existed before, because that didn't really allow for a lot of younger artists to really develop their practices or to think about art from the point of ideas or idea making or form making even, because uh, everything was very traditional. If you were a painter, you had to paint. You couldn't do any other thing. You couldn't think of um, a building as a painting, you know? So he's, he, uh, he and a couple of other professors formed this uh, organization called Black Star Alliance, Kumasi, which was um, deliberately aimed at community building within the university. Because prior to that, a lot of artists were being thought how to create like individual practices because the older generation, if you were a painter, if you were making paintings, you were making paintings for a hotel or a gallery space to begin with. 
So you didn't really have time to think about the larger community to begin with in terms of art making. But we, uh, caricature and this group realized that it was really important to think about how the generation which was emerging, it was really important somehow to expand this notion of art making and artistic practice. So I'm starting the presentation with this uh, image of uh, one of our colleagues at the university. Her name is Ajokise. And uh, this is uh, in March 2019 when we opened this space in uh, Tamale called the Savannah Center for Contemporary Art. And again, uh, she's working on an exhibition which is aimed at a very older artist in Ghana. His name is Mr. Kofi Dawson. And uh, I, had, I started a conversation with him in 2015 regarding uh, a studio space I was building at the time. I didn't really know that it was going to become a retrospective space or an exhibition space, but I just gave it a go. So I had a conversation with him regarding looking at his work and presenting it to the public in Ghana because we don't really have a lot of, yeah, we have uh, like uh, institutions like the FCA, Nobuki, like our institution Black Star Lines, some galleries, but in terms of like looking at it on a national scale, we don't, the state doesn't, for me it's not enough, investing enough into culture and also like really developing spaces which somehow allows for ideas to strive. So I thought it was important to look at it from that angle. Um, so I will talk through briefly about my practice. I really want to talk about this um, new aspect of my practice where I'm really looking at developing spaces and all that. So in 2000 and, um, I think it was 2012, I was uh, traveling to Burkina Faso. Before then, I was, as I said before, I was largely painting. Uh, and I used to paint like, like super realistic and all that, but um, there was always this need to, to ask more questions about what an idea of a painting was. So in 2012, I was traveling to Burkina Faso, and for some reason, we were, you know, when you're traveling across um, Africa, it can be quite difficult. But sometimes when you are at the border, you realize that there are a lot of uh, trucks that are carrying goods and commodities, and those goods and commodities travel very easily. They move from one country to the other, but people are stuck at the borders for hours and hours. So I, there was a truck that was transporting these uh, onions and other things, and they were bagged in this material. And I thought that was really interesting in terms of how commodities get to transcend borders and all that. And, the human beings that produce these things are somehow trapped within spaces. So when I came back home, I decided that I was going to work with this material to somehow look into the history of the material and all that. And as I started looking much deeper into the material, I realized that there were so many contradictions. Uh, in Ghana, when um, we, we are the uh, second largest producer of cocoa in the world, and in the 50s, a lot of the uh, cocoa that was produced when we sold it and we got a lot of uh, foreign exchange. The money was used in a lot of infrastructural development. And a lot of those uh, developments were also done within the Cold War era. So we had uh, a lot of relations with uh, Eastern European, Russian architects, a lot of buildings which were built at a time when there was a real need to somehow, for Africa to somehow uh, untie itself from Europe and the West, but a lot of these ideas never really came to light. It never succeeded. So in my work as an artist, I've always been very much pondering about these systems and these histories through infrastructure, architecture, even the history of painting, sculpture, weaving, or any other thing. So I started traveling across the country and looking at spaces. You find that there are so many contradictions around us. This is from a, a, a workshop in uh, Ghana in the West Coast, uh, it's called Sekendi. And um, in, the early, uh, in the early 20th century, late 19th century, the British built this enormous railway system to extract commodities, gold, uh, manganese, bauxite, cocoa, and other things. And this is a chimney, one of the chimneys that was used in processing like the coal and coke. Uh, and, uh, I said they were using coal and coke within there to process some of the things that were using within these uh, workshops and all that. But now, they no longer use it, so you have plants and other things growing in it. And I find it very interesting. Like, how do you have plants growing in a chimney? Uh, I think those contradictions are very important, like for us to look at things really, really closely. Um, so uh, this is one of the trains which was used within the colonial periods, which has like, uh, um, I think this is a cassava growing within it. 
And I find it very interesting in terms of how agriculture, life, and other things can somehow uh, take over machines and things like that. So this is one of the buildings I was talking about, uh, the silos. So this was built in the early 60s, at a time when Ghana was very industrious and in trying to create this economic program for the storage of food, but it was never completed. And it was completely abandoned. So almost 60 years down the line, you go there and the building is somehow trapped in time. But I like to pay attention to things. So there is, um, yeah. So this image here is uh, another building because the silos were built across the entire country, but they were, they were stopped at very different stages. So I like to look at it from all those different aspects. Um, you realize that there is a crane at the top of it. And the crane was what was actually used in lifting the concrete in the construction. And more than 60 years, it's just been trapped in time. I always ask myself, if I, if I had a chance to go back in the past, how would it be? Like, because they were filled with potentials at the time, but they were never completed. So now, 60 years down the line, how do we reimagine these spaces in their state of decay as they are currently? So this is a drone image that I took off the top of the silo. So you can still see the crane and all the iron rods and infrastructure which was being used in building it. Um, yeah, this is another version of it in another city, actually in Tamale. But this, they only started it to a point and they stopped it. So you can actually, it's, it's a very different structure now. If you were to come from a different planet, and then none of these existed, and you saw only pictures of it. You think it was the same building which was constructed, and there were different pictures that were taken of it. So I like that idea of time travel where you can look at an object and then imagine it in very different stages and potentials in a way. So this is a different version of it in Accra at a former food processing company. Um, this is a very different one. And they're very massive in, uh, structures, you know. And, I just, I, I keep asking myself, because at the time when it, uh, the, these were done, um, when they were built, the, our president was overthrown in 1966. So it's a very long, complicated story. But the shot of it was that uh, there was a coup that was uh, masterminded by the CIA, because he, uh, Nkrumah, was kind of a socialist, and the idea was that how do you create infrastructure, because capitalism was getting out of hand. But if we can create spaces that can somehow allow us to be able to take control of our destiny within the continent, then it helps in a way that can bring some kind of prosperity to the people. But within that period, there were a lot of coups, and most of them were a lot of the leaders who were really interested in that disconnect between the umbilical cord with the Africa and the, uh, the West. So I, in as much as I'm interested in that story, I'm more interested in the objects that came along with it and the potentials that came with it. Um, this is an image of the, the um, second D, the railway workers in 1960s. So I, I, I like to go into the archive. I spent a lot of time at a railway station where a lot of the workers spent long hours of labor to produce things to restore the railway infrastructure. A lot of it doesn't run anymore, but when you go there, there is so much potential and so much life as to the way you can read the possibilities of things. Uh, uh, this is an archival image of, um, yeah, from the early 20th century of uh, the British actually offloading gold into um, like some containers which are being sent off to England. Yeah, today when people talk, when we talk about issues of Brexit and all that, and the Brits said, oh, we want to be alone. I'm like, no, you cannot be alone. You've, uh, <laughs> you've, yeah, you've, you've been everywhere, you actually, and you've taken from, yeah, you've taken, you've taken so much from the world. So, yeah, we really need to, it's, this is the time more to think about one another and to help each other uh, within this uh, global world that we live in. Um, so, there are images of, um, um, architecture, things that were built within the period which were assembled and then transferred to other places. So if you think about architecture in itself, it's not so innocent, because sometimes we think of buildings as just as they are, but we don't really think about the intrinsic nature of them in terms of what they constitute. So I started actually um, looking at the history of spaces, materials, and also given the fact that being in Ghana, we don't really have the luxury of having museums like you have here 
you go to New York and you have like 20 museums. You come here, you have museum for humanity, museum for animals. Like you have museums for everything, you know? But we don't really have that luxury. But I think that with the benefits of hindsight, of looking at what is happening within the world and how capital uh, works, I thought it was really important somehow to relook at things that almost looks like they are completely dead. Because I think there is so much to learn from the idea of the dead and ghosts because they present us with new forms of life that we necessarily don't think of when we think about it. So I started collaborating with uh, these young women who travel from the north and other places to the city to find greener pastures. And they work under very hard labor conditions. And for me, I'm very interested in the in labor and complicating it as much as I can. So I understand that in a way to produce an artwork, uh, you're not making, a lot of artists turn to like being irresponsible in a way that they think that once they make a work, that's the end of it. Because it ends up in a white cube or in a gallery and there is so much detachment from it. But I think that we have to somehow, I'm not saying every work has to, but we have to make a conscious effort to really acknowledge what goes into the production systems. And somehow, maybe through our own interventions and means, we can change the way we experience the world or other people. So these are the railway stations. So we, I started using all kinds of different spaces as my studio space. So bridges, so this is a bridge that was built in 1934 by Germany, um, and it's no longer used, so I occupy all these spaces. And actually interested in how the residual qualities of these spaces inspire what the artwork becomes. This is an archival image of a factory in Germany, in Kassel. It's called Henschel. And uh, they produce a lot of the trains that were used in the colonial exploits. And still, they manufacture a few things. But during the Second World War, they were also, because Hitler was interested in using Kassel as a military base, so they were producing a lot of tanks and, ammuni and ammunitions. And it was heavily bombed by the Allied forces. So um, this is the factory currently. And I, as part of the work I did in Documenta, the idea was to occupy some of these spaces and somehow re-establish the relations between what a working space is versus like how it is now through like, yeah, occupation through like the residues of commodities in a global system. So this is an image from Castle when we occupied the, the front part of the St. Agma uh, Square in front of the Parliament House. Yeah, it's a drone shot that I took um, of the parliament. Because you realize that each time there are protests, there's always a divide where the street is, and then you have the protests happening here. So I wanted to have that sense of feeling where you almost have the work almost like a, some kind of a stain within the image. Yeah, I, in a lot of the work that I do, I go into archives a lot, so I borrow drawings for, uh, to help me think about how space works and all that. Um, so these are some of the early images of works that I produce in my, I think, yeah. All, most of the works that you see go, come in uh, were mostly done when I was uh, a student doing my MFA. So they were mostly, um, yeah, like trying to occupy these spaces which are being used by people ordinarily in a way because I wanted to find ways in which we could expand the artistic experience because it's not everyone who goes to a museum and we don't even have that to begin with. So how do you begin to present or produce work that expands upon this uh, notion? And people, there are a lot of questions that are being asked. Um, what is like, I think sometimes artists are afraid because they want to produce things and they want uh, people to already know what those things are. But I think art is most exciting when you produce it, and you, even you yourself, you cannot understand what it is. Then, for some reason, life comes into it as it goes along. So this is the university library where I study. Um, this is a different building. I was invited to do this project at the university uh, last year um, at the Great Hall where we're having a congregation. We've come such a long way with projects like this uh, happening back at home. Um, uh, this is the National Theatre um, in uh, Accra. So I, in a lot of the projects that I've done, sometimes I send proposals to institutions and then they accept those proposals. So we made this project. And this was, I think, the first international show that I did at the Saatchi Gallery in London in 2014. 
um, in Venice in 2015 when I did the Biennale, um, All the World's Futures. Yeah, and this was at a broad museum in Michigan, um, at, uh, in East Lansing, um, uh, in 2015, I think. Um, so th th it was a combination of both looking at interior and exterior spaces. Um, this was in Copenhagen at the Kunsthaus Schlottenberg in 2016, I think. Um, and this was at the Tel Aviv Museum of Contemporary Art in 2016 also, I think. I quite remember a few of them. Um, yeah, and this was in Kassel as part of Documenta in 2017. Um, yeah, and this was this year actually in Milan as part of a project that I did with the curator, Massimiliano Gioni, uh, who is one of the directors of the new museum in New York. And uh, it was basically occupying these two buildings called Porte Venezia, and the title of the work was called A Friend. And um, yeah, basically dealing with the histories of these buildings in relation to the crisis in Europe at the moment, and particularly with uh, the situation in Italy, with all the immigration crisis and all that. Um, but dealing with these ideas through the poetics of materials. Yeah, so um, there are a lot of different objects that I've been interested in going through my practice. Um, I've collected all kinds of things. So there was a work that I made in 2000, and because I, I, I spent quite a long time producing these works, and sometimes it takes me a few years to produce them, but I never showed them until one day I decided, why don't I show it? So this was at a White Cube in London in 2017 as part of a show I did, um, and it's called Donna Rentable. Um, so the work comes in different forms. This was in Brazil, in uh, Belo Horizonte. And uh, as I said, I go back and forth. So the idea of painting and sculpture for me is very broad. So the artwork could be anything. Uh, so this was part of a work that I did in uh, Antwerp in Belgium, which actually dealt with the history of these racist monuments of a Belgian priest with a so-called Congolese savage at his feet. So for me, the form could be anything. It could be a drawing, it could be a sculpture, it could be print, it could be a building, it could be just anything. And I know there's always a lot of uh, conversation regarding even the Confederacy and the statues. People say, why don't we, uh, you leave the, there's always this argument about what happens to the Confederate statues. Like, do we leave them in the public or do we destroy them or we, do we take them and put them in the museum or somewhere? But I think the moment when you begin to leave something in a public space, because this sculpture is still in a public space, the moment you start to leave them in a public space, then you are somehow legitimizing that history. But if you take it and you put it, you don't destroy it and you put it even in a museum, by just that decision of shifting where the object is to another place, I think it's very political and it's very important. So um, I, I was looking mostly at that in relation to the history of rubber extraction in the Congo. This was a different work that I did in Malta um, called The Straight Line Through the Carcass of History, looking at this old fish market and like, yeah, looking at yeah, simple forms, a work that changes depending on where you stand to look at it. Yeah. And sometimes it's, it was very confusing, particularly with this work, because it was with a building that was almost falling apart, an old building. So when the work was installed and people came into the space, they actually thought that the work was there to support the building from falling apart. And, and I like that idea that people see art and they don't recognize it. It, yeah, you don't always have to recognize it. As, you know, as much as it, it allows you to think and ponder, it's good enough for me. So this is a different work that I did in Berlin, uh, also titled A Straight Line Through the Carcass of History, from the same series of these medic stretchers that were used in the Second World War in Greece, uh, which I collected and then reused uh, for this exhibition. So I collect all kinds of things, cabinets, anything. For me, I don't have any limits to what I collect or being interested in. So this is uh, cabinets from the railway in Ghana, which are being used by the workers. And I collected some of them, and I collected the archives also from the railways, uh, metal shavings from the trains, like books from pupils and all that for the production of this work. Uh, recently in Manchester called the Parliament of Ghosts, where I basically have been collecting all of these old train parts. 
seats, particularly to begin with, to build this parliament where the artwork becomes a place where people convene and have discussions and, and ponder over ideas, um, share over conflicts, anything, you know. So um, that's my st studio assistant, Francis, uh, representing there. Uh, yeah. Yeah, sorry. I, he's always posing for my images. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there were a lot of uh, things that were done within the, so this was a seven channel video with projectors that we did. We built this silo structure where you could experience these videos that I had made as part of the exhibition. And this was one of the older forms of work that I had done in my undergrad uh, MFA, these old paintings, which I never showed. But because of the connection to the Industrial Revolution in Manchester, I was uh, I was really interested in like finding that connection through this uh, specific form. Um, so back to the railway with archives. So I, yeah, I've been collecting all kinds of things, drawings from the trains. I commissioned people to make like tens of thousands of different drawings for these museums. So I spent a lot of time in archives. So I went to York, the National Railway Archive in England, to look through their archives and then find materials for some of the works. Um, so these are Nigerian uh, engineers who went to England in the 60s to learn how to fix some of the locomotives that were being used in Nigeria to be able to go back and fix them. So, and then we come to the uh, current aspect of my practice. So these guys, are, so this is my dear friend and colleague Bernard Akwe Jackson, and he's um, one of the professors at the university. Uh, but he's also an artist, performance-based. And uh, he, uh, when I started developing this conversation with the artist, Mr. Kofi Dawson, in 2015, I had a conversation with him to curate the exhibition. Uh, so he was a curator of it. And all the other guys that you see, and Tracy Thompson, who is a very prom uh, promising upcoming artist, we decided that if we are going to, yeah, if we're building a community, then we might as well like do it like really well, like hand in hand. Because for me, being an artist and practicing, I've somehow come to really uh, see how the art world operates. There's so many contradictions to it, you know. Uh, as an artist, sometimes you are in a position where you think you have to produce and produce and produce and produce work. But there are some artists also who produce work and also produce projects or produce things that somehow poke at the art world. And I realized that I was at the yeah, at a very early age, I somehow felt that I was more interested in producing things that would somehow be more em yeah, emancipatory in a way in its experience. So the idea of the community building, which I was uh, talking about with Black Star Lines from my university, was something that I wanted to follow up on. So we started working with the students, actually, to fabricate parts of the exhibition and all that. So. We, um, in 2014, uh, when I started uh, selling some of my artworks, I was interested in like, uh, coming back to this idea of not having institutions. So I thought, why not build a studio which we can also use for exhibition, space, exhibition spaces? And then uh, I constructed this space called SCCA Tamale. So it's like Savannah Center for Contemporary Arts. And uh, we basically dedicated it purely to retrospectives, to looking at artists' practices, not just artists, but also architects, engineers. We started with the first exhibition actually in March this year, and the idea is to have exhibitions on for really long periods. So the first exhibition actually is on for eight months. So we take time and we do exhibitions and we really go deep into them. But yeah, so this is a picture of the interior. Um, so there is a, so through my interest in labor, there is a real interest in how these spaces are produced. So the, the point of painting is that they, there, there shouldn't be any kind of distinction between like the construction of the space versus what occupies the space. So uh, these are some images of when we were doing the construction process with the students and then how it looked like even with like, uh, the local painters and people we're working with to somehow tie the exhibition together. Yeah, so um, Mr. Dawson is an artist who's worked really, really extensively, and he's done a lot of works like, um, he is, um, 
he, among his generation, he was one of very few artists who experimented widely. So he was interested in like making papier mache, painting, sculpture. He was a public servant, so he used to work at the information service department. So to make uh, posters and all kinds of things. And I think that heavily influenced his practice. Um, the reason why we decided that he was the first artist we were going to work with was because of the experimental value that came with his work. Because a lot of the artists within his generation had somehow felt that they had found a way to make art, and those ways became established. But for us, we're always looking at that point where the artist is always going back and forth in between. That sense of uh, not being sure enough and then always questioning oneself, I think, is very important. So. The, the space we actually dedicate, when I think about these spaces that I'm working on currently, I'm thinking mostly about children, because when we were children, we never had these um, opportunities. But I think that it's important what it does, not just, um, not just from an ideological perspective, but also a way of experience in the world and what people produce, ideas that people produce. Um, so. When you come to our programs, most of it is mostly uh, children. Um, we've, uh, we, we wrote an extensive program covering all the schools within the region. So every week we try as much as possible to get the students there, and then we run workshops and things like that. Um, yeah, some of these images are dark. But we are, so the artist does a series of workshops with the ideas because he used to make his own brushes. So even at the age that he was working in, because if you're looking at artistic practice in Ghana from the 60s downwards to the 90s, there weren't many people who were doing a lot of the things that he was doing. So we really wanted to go back to this idea, but yeah, somehow representing it in a way that uh, the kids can really understand the significance and the value of it. So sometimes we convert the exhibition space into like a classroom or something like that. So I've learned quite a lot of some of these uh, organizations and all that. So this is the artistic director of the space, uh, Abraham Kuji. He's a, P a PhD candidate at the university, and he was my colleague actually in undergrad. So um, he is someone who is very much interested in ideas, and so why not? Like, <laughs> because it's very important. As we grow along, sometimes you realize that you have colleagues who are very, not just very sensible, but people who are very interested in the future. And somehow, you collaborate and work with them to make uh, things happen. So we've done all kinds of things. So recently, we did a, a workshop called Serious Play, which actually took aspects of the exhibition, and we actually converted the, the exhibition space into a classroom within a period of the exhibition. Yeah, so all kinds of things, painting, drawing. And these things were, I'd never really things that are very common because if you are, and it's not just with art, so later on you see some of the other things I'm dealing with. It's, um, it's, it runs across, even in the field of music, architecture, engineering, uh, agriculture, what have you. So it's only a point of entry into how we can explore these new freedoms and it uh, presents these uh, equal opportunities in a way that people think. Yeah, so coming back to the factories again. So I always go back and forth, um, borrowing ideas and forms. Uh, we have a lot of spaces in Ghana, buildings which were built, affordable housing, like the silos and other things. But these ones were built actually in the last 20 years, and they were never completed. So I go back to these spaces again and again. How can we inhabit spaces, you know? Sometimes not having a museum, because some of these museums are so strict in a way that they are that it cannot even allow artists to begin to think about certain specific formats of work, you know. So I borrow a lot of ideas from these kinds of textures and decays and all that. So I, as part of the idea of the SCCA, I started looking at the idea of like uh, artists occupying land and intervening within land as a form of practice. Because a lot of people buy land and they convert it to real estate and all that. But I decided that I was going to buy some land within uh, some communities and actually convert them into like uh, institutional spaces, parks, um, museums, um, studio spaces, all kinds. So I started uh, collecting all kinds of um, objects. 
So I, yeah, in the north, there is a tradition of using like mud and not so much of bricks to build uh, historically, but it's also because of the climate there because it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it gets really hot. The average temperature is like 32 and then on a very good day, it's like 45 degrees. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I remember when I came here, someone was telling me today that we, we, we came in the best time of the year. We were having such a good weather, and I was like, I don't think so. <laughs> I've, seen, I've seen much better weather. <laughs> you can't beat 45 to 50 degrees. Yeah, so um, I started making these. Uh, we started producing bricks, actually, for the production of these uh, spaces. So uh, these are new spaces which I'm hoping to open next year in February. Um, so, yeah, I think, yeah. So as you can see, we have this aircraft here. And I started collecting these old aircrafts that belong to old companies. Um, so we t what we do is that we take out the seats, some of them, because some of them are really large. They seat up over 100 passengers. And then using those seats for the fabrication of the cinema space, which uh, we're also hoping to open next year. Um, yeah, so this better view. And these lands are actually, so there is this, sh I don't know if any of you have ever seen these share nut trees. So a lot of the oils that we used, we use here, Nivea and everything, they actually come from these trees. Um, they are produced, they mostly grow within the savannah region, within the north, but there isn't enough attention that is given to them. There is this kind of myth around them because it mostly happens when birds pick on seeds and then they plant them elsewhere. So people have come to believe that you can only pick them, but you cannot plant them. But it's not true. You can plant them. So I have actually been thinking about how we can combine this idea of uh, the share nut uh, as, yeah, as a way of occupying space and land rather than cutting everything in relation to the architecture and all that. Yeah, so these are images of like process of a building. So you can imagine like when I'm thinking about, um, what's the name, um, architecture and thinking about painting at the same time. It's my mind always goes back and forth in between these things. Like how do you build something, but at the same time, how do you occupy the same thing or invite other people to occupy it? Uh, so these are images of some of the projects from the beginning, from 2000 and yeah. I work with engineers to dig, excavate spaces, and then test for um, like yeah, structural integrity things, like how can we construct specific spaces and all that. Before that, there were no things that artists necessarily would think about, because as artists, you think that your job is just to make artworks, which will end up hanging in a museum. But I think that there is a lot more to it, because Artists within this age have to realize that there is a lot more that needs to be done and we have to exercise a lot more responsibility in the way we think about forms. And form doesn't necessarily mean something which can be within a space. It can be something that can also occupy us in a way, in forms of ideas and all that. So this is the interior of one of the spaces. I like to show uh, images of things in progress. Um, yeah, so coming back to the Parliament of Ghosts again. So the, parla the idea of the Parliament of Ghosts is to be able to create a space that allows us to be able to reflect and think through using history as a, as a form of material. So some of these spaces are actually past the, way past the stage, but these are older images because I've been traveling a lot in the last month, so I haven't had time to be home. Um, so this is an interior of an aircraft uh, which uh, I purchased, which I was very interested in the interior because it almost looked like, a, like some kind of a spacecraft which was somehow ex which was exploding in space or something like that with all the interior coming off. Uh, so how do we allow spaces like this to somehow feed our imagination and the way we use those uh, spaces, occupy them? So back again at the aircraft and looking at it in relation to um, spaces that we construct. Yeah, so these are the other aircrafts uh, which we are using as part of the space. And then trying to find different creative means actually in which we can combine these aircrafts together with cinema and also with history. Uh, also dealing with issues regarding archeology span 
um, yeah, it's important. It's like you're at a moment when you realize that you are, you have a very, yeah, yeah, you have a very important chance to be part of a, a moment in history where you redefine things. So what do you do? Do you just fold your arms and st sit aside because generally you can be successful as an artist working with big galleries and doing big exhibitions, but it's never enough because at the end of the day, we always ask a question, what is uh, the whole idea of uh, the human experience within specific spaces? Because there are a lot of children and people who grew up in these spaces, but they never really get to experience things because there are artists in, uh, on the continent who produce work, very significant works, and all those works end up being in museums abroad. So if I'm a Ghanaian, in order even to, for me to see a work of a great Ghanaian artist, I have to travel all the way to New York or to London or something like that. But what if we could actually, for a moment, just pause, and then through the capital that we earn through our work, realize that there is a lot more to be done. And we construct spaces which can actually reoccupy these objects. So when I'm making work, I'm actually thinking, how can this work be significant at home, rather than always just floating in the sky and being elsewhere in the world. So I, 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 yeah. I always say that as a child, I didn't play enough. So this is the time. I'm, I'm exploring all the ideas. And it's, you know, it's fascinating because some of these work, some don't work. You fail, some you succeed. But I think the most important aspect of it is that element of failure because it allows us to be able to at least look beyond what we think that we know. Um, yeah, so I make a lot of drawings most of the time in, with regards to ideas and how I think about some of the specific projects and spaces I'm working on. Um, yeah, back again, drawings again on future institutions and how we somehow think about space together with objects. Yeah, I would like to end by saying that it's really, really important for us to really uh, somehow get to understand this very notion of freedom in a way that for me it's never enough. Yeah, because people always think that you, maybe you live in a place where there is, yeah, you have a freedom, but there's always more to be done, you know. Uh, the fact that we have freedom means that we have to be more responsible and we have to push for even more freedom, not just for ourselves, but also thinking about it in relation not just to other life forms, humans living elsewhere, but also thinking about it in relation to the sustenance of the, the planet. Um, so thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. uh.